Grafting and budding fruit and nut trees are skills that improve with experience. There are few more knowledgeable and experienced about grafting walnuts than Alex Suhan, founder and owner of Suhan Farm and Nursery in Upper Lake, Lake County, California. Alex's career as a walnut farmer began in 1943. He grafted his first walnut trees in 1948. This video features Alex as he demonstrates the art as well as the science of budding, grafting, and correct planting of walnut trees. Further information on the methods employed to propagate walnuts as well as other aspects of walnut production may be found on the UC Davis Fruit and Nut Research and Information Center website. We can graft walnuts for the same reason that mm, virtually all fruit trees and nut trees are grafted or budded. We have to uh, get a variety. Um, that's the only way, either budding or grafting, to get an orchard with all one variety of, of crop. If you were to get a hundred walnuts and plant them and let them grow up and start producing, you'd have a hundred different kinds of walnuts. Different leafing dates, different qualities, different everything. So with grafting, then they're all identical, they're cloned. Grafting is always done in the spring. Um, and that varies in where you're located in California. If you're in the southern part of the state, in Visalia, Tulare County, you can start grafting the last few days of January. If you're in Lake County, uh, we can't graft until the very earliest, the 1st of May, because of the weather conditions that we have here. Um, budding can be done in the fall, um, in August, early September, as well as budding can be done in the spring when grafting is done. The, what graft you choose depends on the size of the trees, uh, pretty much totally. If they're uh, very small trees that have been planted, and, well, some trees can be planted and grafted the very same spring. Uh, if you have very good growing conditions, very good care, um, that can be very successful. The um, probably more normal method is um, that you plant the walnut seedlings and you grow them a year and then you graft them. Um, if, if they're quite small, you graft, uh, use a whip graft. And if they're larger, two or three inches in diameter, then you use a bark graft. Um, of course, many orchards are started from trees that are grafted in the nursery or budded in the nursery, but we're not talking about that today. I've been grafting since 1948, and I have made many mistakes. And so with this work that we're doing today, we're hoping to help you folks not make all those same mistakes. On the young trees particularly, the, the small trees that we whip graft, you must keep the weeds away from them. Very, 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 very important. Keep the weeds, and I mean when they're one inch tall, not when they're waist high. You must keep them away. And then uh, adequate moisture. Generally, most people believe that you shouldn't water a tree. You shouldn't water a tree uh, after it's grafted until the grafts have uh, started growing quite well, uh, uh, three or four inches perhaps. The thought is that some conditions that can cause bleeding to start. Actually, trees, when you cut them up to graft them, their, their moisture requirements are somewhat gone down because you've, especially the bark grafters, you've uh, removed so much of the tree top, there's not much moisture consumption going on. Uh, so it's 
they don't require as much water during that early time as they would if they were still growing as seedlings with a full canopy. We're going to cut grafting wood for walnut grafting. Uh, I want to point out that this tree was grafted, it's gone through two growing seasons. The first year this main stem grew, this last year these side branches grew. And I could mention that this was a pretty big tree because we changed varieties here and uh, generally you wouldn't have a two-year-old top on a tree that big. So, um, in, to begin with, I like a older tree, a couple of years older, or at least one year older than this, so that you've had a chance to see the walnuts that it produced. Um, there's been a couple instances in California where they've had some terrible mix-ups and um, been grafted wrong varieties on because the people did not see the production of the tree before they cut the grafting wood. So a tree a year or two older than this would give you a chance to see the crop. And um, so we, we want a tree that's growing vigorously, making big long growth. And we usually only use about the base one third of the wood. Um, if you're very short of grafting wood and conditions are ideal, you can use wood a little farther out. But uh, if things are not perfect, you don't want to. This, uh, this piece is not the best in the world. It's, it's pretty long between the inner nodes and we don't, we like the inner nodes to be a little closer. Uh, now this one is better in that regard. Um, it has a, a bud here, or a set of buds here, and a set of buds there, and another set there. We also looking for a piece of wood that has two buds in each uh, spot, a primary bud and a secondary bud, so that if something happens to the primary bud, you've got a, another shot at it. And uh, this one only has a primary bud. This one has a primary and a secondary. This one has a primary and a secondary. This one has a primary and a secondary. So it's a, a better piece. So we would cut that off there and cut it off here. Um, another problem uh, with grafting wood is that it be best if you didn't drop it on the ground because uh, the crown gall organism can be on the soil and oftentimes is. And uh, if your sign would hit the ground, you could get it inoculated and then you get graft uh, crown galls in the graft union. And I have seen a couple of times where it's been an epidemic in orchards and in nurseries. And so to avoid that, you stay off the ground. So anyway, there's uh, one piece. And then uh, I like this one pretty good, so we'll take it off. And uh, so we uh, we only want the, the lower portion. This is getting pretty small. The um, diameter of the wood you're using depends a lot on uh, on how strong the grafter is. If you're big and tough and strong, you can use pretty big wood, but uh, Personally, I don't like real big wood because it's just too darn hard to cut. Um, if you're whip grafting, you need wood that's about very much the same size as the tree that you're, at the point that you're gonna graft the tree. 
So uh, that depends somewhat. So anyway, here's another piece. This is quite a bit smaller. And if it's a nice firm piece of wood, I mean nice and round and mature looking, um, being small really doesn't hurt any. And uh, so we're using about the, that portion there. Um, another thing to watch for is uh, that the buds are really vegetative buds. This particular piece has catkins. And uh, there's uh, two catkins there, there are two catkins there, and there's one uh, uh, vegetative bud and one catkin bud there, and then one catkin bud there. And that's a real poor piece of wood because uh, the catkins aren't going to get you anywhere. So you have to watch for that. This is a primary and secondary bud, both together, is what we really want. So then the next thing is to store the wood, and if you're just doing a few pieces, you put them in a plastic bag um, with some moist material in there, moist shavings, or, uh, or just very few, you can even moist paper bags, and hold them in the refrigerator at uh, 32 or 33 or 34, um, and don't put them in the freezer, because that'll probably kill them. Uh, if you're doing a whole bunch, you use uh, people store them in uh, in uh, peach bins uh, and um, with moist shavings. We don't want the shavings soaking something wet, um, but they, it wants to be moist. And also, uh, uh, most people are, prefer uh, kiln uh, shavings off of kiln dried pine. Some of the shavings that you can buy, which is just a bedding mixture, I don't think is too good. This is the tools and supplies that we use when we're bark grafting. We, of course, have to have the saw to cut the tree off. Um, we use electric drill, not always, but sometimes. We have a knife, and we have the hammer, and we have nails, and these are wire nails. They're one inch by 17 gauge, and uh, most of our grafting, that's the size we use. Um, on older trees with thicker bark, we would use a little longer nail, but still a, a 17 gauge. Um, we have here little waters, just in case we need to dilute our paint or get the black stuff off our hands. We have the sealer, um, which it's very important to make sure you have the sealer that says grafting on it because the same company makes a sealer that's a, just a pruning sealer and it will not be good on grafting. We have a little brush to apply it. Um, we have um, white interior latex paint that we dilute about half and half with water and a little brush. We use um, these little saran wrap type things in our ceiling and they come off of this roll of stuff. Uh, sometimes we use um, a masking tape, and sometimes if there's a problem, we use this earwig bait. And of course, we've got to have a supply of water nearby. We're going to bark graft this tree. And um, bleeding walnut trees is the biggest problem to successful grafting. This is an example of bleeding from a pruning cut. Bleeding is caused by the walnut tree's natural reaction to wounding, but is more pronounced in the spring when there is a natural upward movement of sap. The bleeding will cause the graft to fail. The grafts will not grow if the tree is bleeding at the grafting site. If they're bleeding up at the graft union, they're not going to grow. And uh, so we cut the tree down, preferably about a week or 10 days before you're going to graft. And we gash it. You see, we, we put a couple gashes here and you notice they're in there about a half inch at least into the sap wood. Um, and we made a couple of those gashes uh, a week ago. And so now today, 
we want to make a couple of fresh gashes because they, uh, the old ones may have tend to heal up a little bit and we, we cannot have any grafting or any bleeding on top. After gashing the bottom, we cut the top of the tree off with a fresh cut so that our graft will be placed into fresh wood that is not dried out. I will cut about six inches below the pre-cut, making sure to be careful not to tear the bark at the top. Now, we could cut it here, but the lower you go, the more apt you are to have a bleeding problem. And of course, in this area, we have a lot of deer, and so we'd like to go a little higher, maybe to avoid the deer. Um, also, we, as I said, we do like to, uh, we do uh, want some uh, foliage, leaf surface to help feed the tree, but we don't want to <clears throat> leave any of this stuff very close to the graft site because it uh, will cause competition, direct competition to that. So we, uh, we want our, our nurse limbs way down. Um, on many occasions, or some occasions, the only nurse limb that I have on the tree is right here, and uh, I'll take it off because I just don't want it up near the graft union, graft site. Uh, another thing that we do oftentimes if the bleeding is quite severe is drill a couple of holes in there. And uh, I learned that from Gene Sir, the University of California wall specialist years in, in 1950s. And, uh, if, if you can't get the bleeding to stop, the, um, the drill helps there. So, so uh, this tree we'll put two scions on. <clears throat> on, a, on a larger tree, a little larger, you'd put on three. And if, if it's about four inches in diameter, you'd probably put on four. Uh, this is wood <clears throat> that we cut uh, during the dormant season. And we've had it stored in a plastic bag in the refrigerator holding it at 32, 35 degrees. Uh, and um, the smaller trees, we use smaller diameter wood. If you have a, a larger tree, you can use a little larger diameter wood. <clears throat> now, I'm not too happy with this piece because I notice it only has a primary bud at each node here. It has no secondary bud. And that's um, not the best situation in the world. Uh, we like to have a primary bud and a secondary bud. I like to chew the piece of wood where the two buds have secondary buds under them. I cut two sets of buds per graft. The length of the wood can be different for each piece. You also do not want the wood too long. Cyan pieces with shorter inner nodes are better. Two buds plus two secondary buds give you four chances to have a successful graft. So we make a fresh cut because uh, that wood's been in the refrigerator for several months, and uh, it might be not too good to, uh, there on the end. So here we go. So a very sharp knife is quite important. And you see, we've made that cut about, what, two and a half inches long, and it is quite flat. And we're going to, we're going to make a little cut on the back side, uh, clear, clear through the bark, exposing the cambium layer. It's very important to expose the cambium layer on the back side. We have a primary bud and a secondary bud right under it there. And over on the other side, we have a primary bud and a secondary bud. So now we're going to, uh, we're going to put it in here. And so this is called bark grafting, and this just slips under the bark. Uh, no skill required whatsoever. Um, I should say that you mustn't start bark grafting until the bark will slip. The trees have to be growing a little bit, otherwise the bark won't slip. You've got to, and so, and of course, different areas of the state, the right time to graft is different. The actual width of this cut 
can be a little wider than this than the sign piece it's not critical to have a close fit on the sides uh, they can be an eighth inch gap on either side with no problem if you have it too tight when you drive this in it's going to pry up the bark on either side so when i say wire nails um, and uh, we put one up here fairly high we hold this down as we drive the nail in so it doesn't squirt back up out of there we want it down there nice and firmly so one nail there and one down near the tip there because uh, I consider that very important that cut on the back side so the one there and so okay so <laughs> So, so we did the same thing that there. We have a flat cut, two and a half inches or so, with a cut on the back side that exposes the the wood and therefore the cambium layer as well. And so we're gonna put it over here. And so there we go. Okay, so the reason that I don't drive these all the way down is that most people, when they make this cut, they don't make it perfectly flat. And so you can see the, I hope you can see the gap that there is there. So if you don't put it all the way down, it'll still fit pretty snugly there. And that's why I do that. Okay, we're going to seal this now with this black stuff. And pretty important to seal down below here because sometimes the bark breaks beyond the cut and if you don't seal a little farther down, you might not get it. So now most people believe that you must come back in five days and reseal it because this stuff cracks. Well, we're not, we don't do that. We've got a little technique here that we eliminate that problem. The plastic wrap I use is from the narrow rolls used for wrapping pallets or pallet wrap. You can also use the plastic wrap from your kitchen. It is just a little more difficult cutting small two by three inch squares. This wrap has a static attraction to itself and is hard to deal with, but I find that if you drop the small squares in a bucket of water as you cut them, this stops the problem. Now I will show you how I use it. So we're going to um, stick that on there and And this is one reason why we have that bucket of water nearby because we end up with this stuff on your fingers. Yeah. So. So then we put another we put another layer 
Now this sealer on top of that. And you don't have to come back in five days <clears throat> and seal it. Again, this is this is going to do it. Okay, and then we seal the top. And that's it. Now, as soon as that dries, as soon as that, which will be two or three hours, then you come and you paint the whole thing white. Signs, buds, everything must be white. And uh, that's very important in this spring weather. If it turns off hot, it could, with this black absorbing the heat, it could just cook them in a couple hours. So just as soon as it dries, they should be painted white. Must be painted white. One should be prepared to take care of the earwigs. If you have an earwig problem, they can uh, eat the buds right out of these signs when they first start to grow. So if we think we have an earwig problem, we put a, uh, a ring of, of masking tape around there and uh, we dump in a little earwig bait. And so when the earwigs come, they get taken care of. And this is not always a problem, but it can be a problem. In this area, the tree will push out sprouts here in two or three weeks and we must keep them all off because if you let them grow they'll compete with the grafts and they'll very can very well starve the graft so it won't grow so we keep them completely off from this area here from there on down we want to keep them under control we can let them get oh two or three times as much greenery as we have here but we don't they, they can grow way out here and then starve the graft out so we have to keep them under control. These um, buds usually start to grow in, a, in a two weeks, maybe three weeks, and once they get going, you need to decide which shoot is gonna make the biggest, strongest growing shoot. And uh, oftentimes there'll be a bunch of shoots come out. We don't want a whole bunch going up um, because uh, we want a, a single leader at this point. So you pinch the tip, tip out of these other ones, and if, say, this one has the best shoot, these shoots you would keep fairly short all summer. So that we can, because we, our goal is to have this thing grow uh, three or four feet above the top of the stake uh, this summer. And so once you get them, uh, them growing good, we use this green tying tape and we, we tie around here loosely. Um, and we do that about every foot, all the way up the, the tree. Um, I grafted this tree last spring a year ago, and both scions grew, and I encouraged the one to go up and make the, the tree. And I kept this one rather short, and there was a big branch here, and I cut off. So anyway, I encouraged it to go up, and it went up above the stake, and I headed it back to there. And the as I say, I tied them with the green tape all summer long. They need to be tied about every foot. And then for the, for the real strength, I like this baler twine. And one go-round usually won't hold it. And, uh, so, and you don't want to just go around here twice, because if you go around there twice and make one tie, if one strand breaks, you lost it all. So with this tie there, if one strand breaks, you still got the other strand. So that's uh, quite important. You don't want them uh, too tight, I mean, too tight here because um, in three or four years that could actually girdle the tree. So you've got to keep them loose so the tree can wiggle and stiffen up better that way. And then you watch and cut these before they girdle.
Bark grafting is used to top work a large tree. This would be used when you want to change the variety of a mature tree. Reasons for such grafting could be that a tree is a variety you do not want in the orchard, but somehow got mixed in when you planted. Or if there's a pollination problem, either you have too much pollen and you want to graft over some of the pollinators to the main variety, or you want more pollinators so you graft over some of the main variety to pollinator. You could also just want to experiment with new varieties. The same graft techniques are applied as I just showed you in the bark grafting demonstration. Each scaffold is grafted over as is the top of the tree. This is an example of a top work tree. To begin, the tree was pre-cut a week to 10 days before grafting. This is to reduce the bleeding problem and also helps in getting the heavy work out of the way. Leaving a nurse limb is very important. It enables the tree to still feed the roots and the transpiration reduces wet soil problems while the tree regrows. All the other scaffolds are bark grafted. Multiple scions are placed on each scaffold. The more scions that grow, the better. They will help heal the cut. They should be removed before they crowd out the chosen replacement branch in a couple of years. Um, in my opinion, this is the way to graft a large tree. There are people in the world that would say, oh gee, we'll just get a chainsaw, we'll cut it off here and we'll put a whole bunch of grafts around there. But uh, that's not good in my opinion. Um, in my opinion, and I believe the University of California literature tells you that about four inches is as large as you want to get. And uh, uh, if the tree is bigger than that, you just move up higher on the tree or move out farther on the branches. Now that's a pretty time-consuming job, but uh, uh, if you were to do like some people would do, cut it off there and graft it, very likely you'd get it to rot inside and the tree would have a rotten heart and would eventually maybe break down. It's just not, not good business. This is quite expensive. If you were uh, hiring somebody to, to graft a tree like that, it probably cost $100 or $150 to do it because it's, it's slow going. On the other hand, uh, you get a full bearing tree pretty quickly if you do it that way because you've got all these branches. And you notice again we've left a nurse, nurse branch there. This is a tree that was top worked last year and it shows the care needed after grafting. We have already seen that the whole tree needs to be painted white just after grafting to reduce sun burning and each grafted scaffold needs to be supported as the new branches grow in the first year. This is done by nailing a long stake to the scaffold and tying the branch as it grows. The supporting stake can be removed after several years. This is the same tree seen in the first shot two years after top working. You can see that when done right, top working can change variety and have a large tree ready to harvest in three years. If you started from a newly planted tree, that tree would be years behind. The grafts have healed and the supporting stakes have been removed. This year in winter, we will thin out the grafted branches by leaving all but one or possibly two on the large diameter scaffolds. The first harvest, you should shake the tree with great care so as not to break the grafts. Here's the tools and supplies that we use when we're whip grafting. There's the knife, and uh, I use this tape to tie the graft. Um, I use this sometimes a little bit, which you'll see. I uh, hope that I never need to use these, but sometimes we do. And uh, we use this quite often, electric drill. We have white interior latex paint diluted about half and half with water. And then we have the tree wound sealer. And when you buy this, you want to make positive that this is grafting compound. Because the same company makes the same color container that says pruning sealer, um, but it's not a grafting compound and it's a very different material and would not work. Okay, this, uh, we are here are going to put on a full, what we call a full whip graft, which means the cyan pieces just about the same diameter as the tree and the proper procedure is to cut the tree off about a week 
in advance or 10 days um, and uh, I to in order for the tree to um, stop bleeding bleeding is the problem with walnut trees and so about a week before graft we cut the tree off and we put some gashes in it and uh, which I did here and so if, if you put the gashes in a week ago we'll put some fresh gashes in it today you see and we want to go a little ways into the sapwood and um, and I should say at this time that the only time that you can successfully whip graft is when you have young trees that are growing very fast very rapidly uh, this tree grew quite well it was planted last spring if you plant trees in an, uh, in an orchard as a replant situation or an interplant situation where the little trees are competing with the old trees you should let them get uh, two inches or more in diameter and bark grafting. Whip grafting is only for very, very fast growing situations. And uh, so we're gonna also drill a, a hole in it here uh, to aid in the, well. And uh, So we, uh, we've selected a piece of grafting wood, and it has a, um, a primary bud and a secondary bud there, and another primary bud and a secondary bud there. So, and you see that piece is just a whisker smaller than that, so it should fit on there pretty good. Um, So we make a nice flat cut there, uh, and about two and a half inches long. Uh, different people have different techniques. Some people make a pretty short cut, but I don't make little short cuts very often. So this is about two and a half inches long. And then we make our little cut here. This is called whip or tongue grafting, and that's the tongue right there. The little tongue, this is gonna lock it into the rootstock. Well. So, we hopefully have a a cut that's very similar and that looks pretty good you see and um, so we're going to make this a cut in this a tongue in the in the rootstock uh, so that when we slip it together it'll be just right Let's, I guess I should be pointing out that we're trying to match the layer right between the wood and the bark with the layer between the wood and the bark on the rootstock. If you're matching the outside, that's not going to work too well you, because the uh, bark you see is much thicker here than it is on this piece that's been in the refrigerator and perfectly dormant. So we're trying to match under the bark, not the outside. And that, um, it doesn't have to match perfectly all the way along. If it crosses in a place or two, that's pretty good. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. So we're going to tie it. And I like to tie it very tight 
and uh, some grafters, many grafters, most grafters don't use this tape. They use a uh, about two inch wide or inch and a half or whatever wide um, plain old masking tape. But I am not comfortable with that. I want to pull it up real tight. To demonstrate how to tie the green tape, I will put a second layer on. First, put the end of the tape under the first few loops of tape, then tuck the finished end under the top loop and pull tight. Cut the loose end. Okay, so now to, to tie it off, we just go through there. And nothing to it. So, so that is, um, <coughs> that's um, pretty much it. Now, we then we will put a little, little gum of black on top. And as soon as that dries, in a couple hours, you paint it white. And that white is very, very important if the weather should turn off hot. If it stays cool, it's not too important. So I like to paint them white just as quick as I can. As these grafts grow, the green tape needs to be cut so that it will not girdle the graft. I do this by making small cuts in the tape after about 12 inches of growth. I will show you with a marker where I cut the green tape. I do it so that the green tape is perforated and as the tree grows, the tree will break through easily, but the tape will support the graft until that happens. If you are using the masking tape, you would not have to make these cuts. We keep all the rootstock sprouts off in this upper area and uh, any rootstock sprouts down low here, you keep them quite short. Now, there's some difference of opinion there. On the planting in the spring and grafting the same spring, the people that are successful believe that you must keep all the sprouts off all the time. Uh, you don't let them grow at all. And some people even believe that with an established tree that you keep all the sprouts off all the time. And I inclined them kind of lean that way so so then again uh, oftentimes when the buds start out they'll have a nut on there too and then they'll stop and mature up two or three buds and two or three buds will start out and so if you want to get maximum growth on the one you pinch the tip out of the other just leave one go and uh, you tie it about every foot uh, with the green tape during the summer We're going to put a side whip graft on this tree. When the tree is a little too small for a whip, uh, for a bark graft and a little too big for a whip, full whip, we put on what we call a side whip. And uh, so I'm going to, we have the same problem with bleeding on these kind of trees as we do the, the uh, bark graft. So um, I'm, I left these stubs when I cut the tree off so that I have a nice fresh place to make some fresh wound wound so that it would it could bleed there got a little more stuff that I'd like left for nurse limbs and so we <clears throat> when I cut it off a week ago I put some gashes in here and you and you may be able to see it's, it is bleeding so we're gonna have a couple of fresh gashes now a little tree like this we don't go too deep and uh, so a couple of gashes there and we could even drill a hole. A nice little bit there. And we go in there, uh, oh, an inch perhaps. And so then we're going to cut the tree off and uh, So, um, this is a, say, called a side whip, 
uh, as opposed to being a full whip. So we're going to get us a cyan piece pretty much like all the other graphs with two sets of bud with a primary bud and a secondary bud. And over on this side we have another primary bud and a secondary bud. Um, so this thing we're going to do the same way. We're going to cut it down to, to just about nothing there. And if this is the one where you keep your band-aids handy when you're making the, the back cut on there. Okay, same old thing, we've got it pretty flat. And then we make a little cut. I, uh, I guess you'd call that a tongue. They call this whip or tongue grafting, so I believe that's what they're talking about. And then we're gonna cut, hopefully just deep enough to be pretty much that size exposed there. We're trying to, of course, uh, match the cambium layer, which is a layer right between the bark and the wood. The cambium layer is out here in the outer edge. And so we want to make this cut so that the cambium layer showing here is going to be about that width so they'll touch. So so this is a little tricky. Um, This is a rather awkward position to be uh, cutting in. But you notice the, the uh, width of the bark here at this, what we're doing here. So we've got to match this outside edge with that inside edge. So, or not outside, but this inside cambium with that one. So we need to uh, get that about the same width in that is not too good yet, but uh, oh come on, okay. So now we're doing pretty good, and so if we can put that in that position, this area here will will match pretty good with that. So we make this cut where we think that it's going to make it all come out together. Oh, okay. So, you see that? That cut there. It, and so, make that a little higher. Okay. So, we, we want this inner between the bargain and wood to, to end up right here. Not out there on the outside edge, but right okay. there. And I'm fairly happy with that. So now we need our tape. We're going to wrap it now. And uh, I'm a re green tape kind of guy. Most grafters use a, a paper uh, masking tape, but I don't, and uh, so some of the folks that use the paper uh, masking tape um, then put sealer over the the black stuff over the top of the paper. But uh, I'm uh, I'm a green tape guy. No, so let's see. We're going to do something here a little different. Uh, sometimes I use the uh, the saran wrap type stuff on that top, and sometimes I use this. So, so. 
we're going to seal the top with the black stuff and we can put a little black stuff on there it may or may not be necessary but um so so that's uh, pretty much it now the thing is if, as soon as this dries then it must be painted white as we showed before painted all white um, another thing to remember that um, when the grafts start growing you got to be prepared to keep all the rootstock sprouts off in this area and don't let these go crazy keep them fairly short and this should go way beyond the stake this year. It needs to be tied about every foot all the way up. Um, and again, this may push out with two or three shoots, and you need to uh, trim them back down to to uh, pretty much one. Pinch the tips on them so that one goes on up. The other thing, uh, when the um, when the um, Graphs are out here oh, a foot or two, two feet. Uh, you probably should cut the tape. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't cut the tape clear off. What I do is I, in the tape, I make some little cuts just like that, in the tape, so that it weakens it, but it's still supporting the graft. And then it'll, if you put some little cuts in it, like that it will expand and break by itself before it gets too tight. This is a short piece of rubber that is used to wrap the buds when finished. You can also use the green tape for the same purpose. If a pair of clippers is needed to cut the graft wood to size, and for knives, you need a double-bladed knife made especially for patch budding. I will show you how it is used later. Finally, you will need a single-bladed budding knife for the other cuts needed. Uh, we're going to patch bud this tree and this is a limb I just cut off the tree yesterday and um, this all grew last year and these are buds of course are all pushed out but back in here is some little dormant buds and again we have a, a um, primary bud and a secondary bud with patch budding you want you have to have real smooth round wood you can't have uh, rough angular wood because when you slip this patch out You've got to have the heart of the buds still in the patch if you don't have don't do it right or don't have the right piece of wood You'll get the patch out <clears throat> and the, the heart of the bud won't be there and the bud won't grow the patch may grow But not the bud. So this is just another piece uh, Of the same thing now. There is another way of doing that of getting buds you can uh, collect this wood that's ideal in the winter time and put it in your uh, refrigerator store it and then in the spring um, that's a little difficult to figure out but bring it out and keep it in a moist halfway warm place not in a hot place and uh, the buds will finally start to loosen up and the, the piece will still be dormant, but the buds will slip. So but that's a little tricky. So if you can go right out to the orchard and cut the buds, um, that I think is better. Maybe here to begin with, I'll see if I can get one out and, sh and show you up close what the buds, the patch is supposed to look like. So anyhow, we have the, the double bladed knife. So then, um, then we made the two horizontal cuts there and then we make a couple of cuts over here to get the width of this patch and uh, so I pull out a little piece there 
because you don't want to pull this patch off because then you won't get the heart with it. You need to slide it so it shears the heart um, well. It, there we go. So now, okay. Um, I don't know if you can see from that distance, but we have the heart still in the bud there. And that's a good thing. <laughs> very, very important. Well, then we uh, need to make a, a cut in the tree with this same knife. and uh, get this bud out, this patch, and and so we can loosen up the corners a little bit so they'll slide, so it'll slide easier, uh, but you don't want to pull it straight up. So here we go with the with the shearing action, and that one looks very good as well. The opening on the rootstock and the bud you have just cut will match on the top and the bottom because of the double blade knife cut. It is not important that the sides touch. It actually helps tighten the bud down not having the sides touch. After placing the bud in the opening, use a rubber to wrap and hold the bud in. This can also be done with the green nursery tape. And we tie that in the same as we did the, the green tape. When you make these cuts, that we can treat them, and sometimes they'll break over. So I like to, to tie that with, so that the wind doesn't break the tree off. Uh, that doesn't happen too often, but it can happen. So, um, and and, um, and I like to <clears throat> leave the top of the tree on there when I bud for a, oh, a week or 10 days so that things are all happening here, everything going normal. Uh, I have seen people bud and then cut them, cut them off right away but that kind of interrupts the healing and the growth and all that kind of stuff so I I believe that you should leave the top on there for a week or ten days and then then you cut it off about there and put some sealer on top and um, and I suppose it should be painted white too uh, pretty quickly so and uh, so hopefully in a, in a week or two the bud will start to grow and uh, so then you keep the rootstock sprouts off as we did on the whip grafts and we tie the grafts up the, up the stake. The, um, there, is another, there is another time of year <clears throat> when there's a lot of budding goes on in walnut trees, patch budding, and that's in the fall in, uh, in the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley. They do that generally around the last week of August and first week of September and they put in buds taking the buds off of the off the growing trees right then um, they're actually would be using this same this same uh, part of the tree and they uh, they cut the uh, the leaves off and just leave a little stub there and and put a patch bud in and put it into the the new growth not the old growth, but the growth, the current season growth. And those generally stay dormant until next spring. So that's entirely different uh, uh, kind of a process. Okay, to begin with, we would want you to keep your tree's roots moist at all times. From the time they, you get them from the nursery, until you, uh, you get ready to plant them. We don't want them laying around and getting dry uh, at all. The tree might survive, but we want the trees to grow real well. We want them to grow perfectly. And so to do that, we want to 
keep them moist so that all these little hair roots will not dry up and die. Um, we need to dig the hole uh, about 22 inches deep. This tree measures 22 inches from where we'd like it to be. And uh, if you dig the hole too deep and leave a lot of loose soil in the bottom, the tree is going to sink the first time you water it, it rains, and it's going to end up too deep. When it's all said and done, we'd like the actual field level to be about here with these roots actually showing. We're going to heap the soil up, though, to cover it well. We got to get that clear that uh, if you leave these roots exposed where we'd like them to show in, in seven, eight years, uh, they probably won't grow. So to begin with, you must fill them up here um, quite high. So the hole is uh, dug with a two-foot auger and um, that will pretty much accommodate those roots. Uh, some people believe you should go snip uh, the end off of all the roots before you plant a tree. Uh, we don't believe that. So we've got this, the planting board and you see we um, We've added some blocks on here to get a little more elevation, and it probably not going to be high enough, but it does. So, um, and we rotate the tree around, and the hole is never quite in the middle of the of the spot it should be in. So, we if we got a longer root, we'll put it where the hole is a little bit bigger. Now, walnut tree will grow, but we want it to grow perfectly. You see, I'm spreading these little roots even. Uh, we don't want to plant like he's putting a string them up in the hole and shovel them full of dirt. We want these roots to look like they were when they're growing in the nursery. If we want the tree to grow perfectly as good as it possibly can. So, and you notice that we're, we're firming the soil here a little bit and uh, put a little more soil in and uh, and uh, <laughs> so, as I say, we, we firm it a little bit here, and we, and this really, uh, it looks kind of slow and pitiful because we're doing it slow and carefully. It can be done quickly if you, if everybody knows what they're doing. A little, a little dirt there, and a little dirt here, and uh, a little, a little firming there, not a whole lot, a little spreading, and. Uh, well, now you see the tree is standing up by itself pretty well, so we can take that board away. So, so we're gonna, we about got it. This is a, a Paradox hybrid well, that's seedling, and um, our plan is to whip graft it this spring. And so we, uh, uh, no matter how careful we are, we've damaged probably, we've probably lost uh, um, three quarters of the root system or more. And so we don't want to leave a full length tree um, because it, um, the, the root system uh, might not support it. So we're gonna, and we're not on the seedlings, uh, when we don't count buds. When you're planting nursery grafted trees, you count how many buds you've got and leave four or six or something. In Paradox seedlings, there's quite a bunch of buds. But uh, anyhow, we cut it off about there. Um, if it were a, uh, see this is a, um, oh what, seven eighths caliper tree. If it was a three quarter one, we'd probably cut it a little more. And uh, if it was a little half inch tree, we'd cut it way down. And another thing I'd like to say is that if you can't quite decide whether you should cut it here or here, we'll cut it down there. Don't don't move up. Move down. If there's any question at all, move down. You can't you can't cut them too short, really. Okay, so we're ready to paint. Um, this is the crown of the tree, and uh, if we don't paint it white clear here into the roots, uh, and this dirt that we're going to heap up on it uh, blows away or birds scratch it away or whatever. Uh, irrigation knocks it down, then this is exposed and it will sunburn and uh, that's not going to be good. And this is white latex paint, about 50-50 with water. And uh, so we get right down here in the roots and uh, so, so that's it. So 
So, so now, boy, I missed the spot, huh? Okay. So, so that's that's it. And uh, as soon as the uh, paint dries, we'll heap the dirt up on it. So we just have to wait for the paint to dry, and then we uh, we want to heap the soil clear up to here, so that the crown is well covered. Uh, I have noticed over the years that if the crown is dry, these, um, the trees are not going to grow. If you firm the soil as you plant, the water should not run down there like it went down a gopher hole. I've seen a lot of people that when they plant trees and they put the water on, you'd think there's a gopher hole under every tree because they didn't firm the soil and there's uh, so much uh, soil collapsing and all that. And I don't think that's the best way to plant trees. The soil was uh, ideal moisture, I would say. So it, it doesn't need much. Oh, there goes the water down the hole. Like that gopher hole I talked about. <laughs> Our plan is to uh, graft this tree in the spring and uh, we'll graft it along and make a little fresh cut and graft it and hopefully it'll grow six or eight feet this uh, coming summer. Uh, sometimes people like to uh, let them grow a year and then they either bud them this next fall or graft them the following spring and so if you're going to do that you're going to leave them another year. When they push out four or five shoots here and they get out here uh, four or five, six inches long. You pick out the one that is growing the straightest and strongest, and maybe the top one and maybe the lower one, and uh, pinch the tip off of the other ones so that you get most of the growth in the one shoot. Otherwise, you're going to have a bushy, fuzzy little thing that the grafter is probably not going to like, or the butter is not going to like. They want one nice big shoot. Um, so now, if you don't prune them to one shoot, the uh, the grafter next year still could come back and graft into this older wood, but it might be quite large and they won't like it. I've been planting them since <coughs> planting trees out in the orchard since 1952.